morning. Thank you for joining us online. This is our second virtual worship service at Island Baptist Church in Beach Haven, New Jersey. And while we continue to be grateful for this technology that God has given us to be able to do things like this, my sincere hope is that it doesn't continue for much longer. We miss you, and our desire is to do this in person, as we were meant to do. In order to ensure that that happens, we want to commend to not just Island Baptist Church, but to all Christians that you obey those that God has put in a role of governance over us, and that we remain at home until such a time as we are able to meet together again in person. This too shall pass. And when it does, my hope and prayer is that God's people will have been refined and that our faith will be a more robust faith in the Lord, having undergone a season of testing and purification. Perhaps when this is all said and done, we might feel as though God has said to us what he said to his people long ago. Here's what he said. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. Let's pray together. I'm going to pray here, and I'm requesting that you pray along with me at home for two things specifically. First, that God would refine his church. That he would make us a bride fit for the King of kings and Lord of lords. And second, that God would heal our land. Would you bow your head now, wherever you are, and pray that with me? Our gracious God in heaven, we come to you now as beggars, with open hands and open hearts, open ears, ready to hear and receive whatever it is that you might have to say to your people For such a time as this. We pray Lord that we would not be complacent. That we would not settle for mere superficial comforts. But that we would wholeheartedly and zealously pursue. The righteousness that Christ died to give us. That we would seek constantly to be more like him. That we would look for you to shape us and mold us in this time more into his image. And so God, none of us knows for certain what it is that you have to do with and through and for your people in this time. But I ask on behalf of everybody that's watching, that whatever your will is, it would be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. For your glory for our shaping, our sanctification, and for our joy, I ask, not only on behalf of Island Baptist Church, not only on behalf of my own family, but on behalf of all your people, I also pray that you would use this time to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the one and only Savior of mankind. And I ask this in accordance with your purpose and your will on the earth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now as Dave comes to lead us in songs of praise and worship for the God that we love and adore. I encourage you just as I did last week to sing along at home. This is not a time for you to view. This is a time for you to participate. If you're alone... Worship with the Lord because he's with you. If you have family, worship, even if you're the worst singer in the room. Sing loud to the Lord. And together, our voices will come together to God as a fragrant aroma. 
Let's worship with him now.
Cause your love is more than life to me My lips will praise your name forever For as long as I live Just this past week, 
Dr. Tom Nichols, a professor at the U.S. Naval War College, wrote something that I wanted to share with you. America, for several years, has become a fundamentally unserious country. This is the luxury afforded us by peace, affluence, and high levels of consumer technology. We didn't have to think about the things that once focused our minds. Nuclear war, oil shortages, high unemployment, skyrocketing interest rates. The COVID-19 crisis could change this, one might hope, by returning Americans to a new seriousness. What Dr. Nichols asserts in this Short quote is true not only for the vast majority of the citizens of the United States, but also for the vast majority of those people living in the United States who would call themselves Christ followers. When God becomes the fringe on the tapestry of our lives, when he becomes an ornament that we put on in order to make our lives appear cleaner, more righteous, more orderly. When he becomes something that is expendable, meaning my day wouldn't be that different whether or not I put God in it. When that's the kind of relationship that God's people become accustomed to with him, that he's just kind of like a side item. And we don't take him as seriously as God ought to be taken. Well, you can mark something down as an absolute assurance. God is going to get his people's attention. He's going to get the world's attention. God has a history of screaming lessons to his people when they stop taking him seriously. And so, the title for this morning's message is The Lesson of This Crisis. I'm certain, as I think you will be too when we're all through with this particular message, that God's lesson for this current crisis is the same lesson that he's been giving to the world since the very first crisis that took place in the Garden of Eden. His message has not changed, despite the fact that different crises come and go throughout human history. In this current crisis, as the world scrambles for answers, and as the leaders of churches and nations and communities look for remedies to put nothing more than a band-aid onto this particular crisis, There sits the Bible with the only permanent solution to this and the more serious crisis of sin that has ever existed. And so, more than anything else, what you and your family need, what my family needs, what the whole world needs right now is to hear very clearly from the God who, in his sovereign authority, has allowed this crisis to ensue on our world. We need to hear from God. You need to hear from God. The president needs to hear from God. And unless we drop to our knees in brokenness and humility and pray None of us will ever hear from him. And so I'm asking you, don't take this lightly. Pray with me now, asking God to open the eyes of our heart, to break through the clogging of our ears that we have intentionally done with countless numbers of other voices, exchanging other voices for the voice of God, spoken clearly through the scriptures. I want to hear from him. Do you want to hear from him? Then let's pray. 
Dear God, I come to you humbly asking on behalf of everyone who may be watching this live or who may be watching this at a later time. Whenever it should come across their path, I pray, dear God, that the Spirit of the Lord would break through and would reach our ears so that we can hear from you clearly. Lord, we're desperate. Not just because there's a new crisis, not because there's a pandemic. There have always been crises. There have always been pandemics. There have always been things of suffering on the planet. But we come to you because we are a people that's slipping away from you. We are a people who stopped taking you seriously. And that must end. And so I pray right now in this service that for whoever it is that's joining us, that you would create a sense of urgency in all of our hearts. A sense of seriousness and passion for God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's common for all human beings, regardless of where you are, where you're from, your background, to develop tunnel vision when the seeds of anxiety begin to set in. So when a crisis begins, however small or large, even if a person shows no signs of fear whatsoever, something begins to happen in all human beings that makes it very difficult for us to see the big picture. Let me explain what I mean. Before I was a pastor, I used to teach self-defense. I owned a couple of different martial arts academies, and my greatest passion at that young stage of my life was teaching law enforcement officers. I was licensed and credentialed by an organization called the International Police Defense Tactics Institute, where I received a license to teach police officers and military personnel, hand-to-hand -hand combat. One of the first things that would come up whenever I would teach them a lesson is how to understand the impact of adrenaline on the human heart and the human mind. Those of you who have a medical background will understand immediately what I'm talking about. Those of you who have ever had to give a speech understand the fight-or-flight syndrome that sets in. That's adrenaline. Police officers, military personnel, and anyone who is regularly exposed to a violent altercation has to understand the effects of adrenaline on the human system or when an, an adrenal dump occurs, they'll go into panic mode. Adrenaline can do some amazing things to a human being. First, it can give you abilities that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. It can make a person stronger. It can make a person react quicker than they normally would, like an athlete. But there are also some negative side effects to adrenaline. When a crisis situation occurs, police officers know that they're left without fine motor skills. And they're left only with gross motor skills. In other words... They're not able to do things that they normally would have to do which require a particular part of the brain. They're only able to do um, things that require a lesser amount of brain activity, gross motor skills. Here's why I'm bringing all this up. Several people have come to me over the past few weeks and explained to me a general sense of tiredness or exhaustion. They'll say to me, Pastor Luke, I'm sleeping well, but I wake up and I just feel tired within an hour or so. Do you understand why that's happening? Whenever someone feels as though their sense of security, or at least the illusion of security, has been tampered with, their adrenal system begins to activate. And so, the majority of people, even those who don't feel as though they're fearful, anxiety-prone, or panicked, their adrenal system has begun. And so you feel tired during the day. Another effect, the key one that I want you to focus on is this. 
When you're constantly throughout the day in this fight or flight mode, checking Facebook, checking Google, looking at the current stats over the uh, coronavirus, your adrenaline starts to flow. And when that happens, your ability to see the big picture, your ability to keep things into perspective is skewed. And whenever that happens, you're unable to think logically and rationally. The reason that I bring all that up is because this is not just true for law enforcement officers and military personnel, but it's a universal truth for all human beings. Here's the big picture that very few are able to see in this current crisis moment because most of us have a restricted perspective. You are not in command of your destiny. None of us is. Despite the Western influence of media over the last 20 years or so that says, you're in control. You're the sovereign commander of this ship that you're driving. You're the one who's in control of your destiny and you can make of it what you will. This is in direct opposition to what God has been teaching mankind since the beginning. You are not in command. You are not driving this ship. And this current crisis has proven that all the different things that we do throughout our lives to give ourselves the illusion of safety and security can be swept away like that. And suddenly... When the reality sets in that you don't have control over tomorrow. You don't have control over the next few seconds. When suddenly a virus, a pandemic, an earthquake, a tornado, a sudden storm. When the lights go out in your house and that panic sets in, your ability to have perspective is skewed. God is screaming the same lesson that he has always been screaming to mankind. And that is that he is in control. Let me show you the most concise place in the scripture where God emphatically declares what it is that I'm trying to tell you. Look at with me at Proverbs chapter 27, the very first verse. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Couldn't be more clearly stated, could it? This crisis has awakened all of mankind to this truth from the mind of Solomon, given to him from the Spirit of God. You don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. And every one of us has suddenly discovered, my goodness, all the things that I've set in place to make sure that I have this illusion of safety and security, none of it's real. I have no idea what tomorrow holds. And this is the way that God designed your life to function. This proverb is Echoed all throughout the scriptures. That's just one short statement of it. The Proverbs are short, wise sayings given from God to you. So that when you build your life on truths like this, it will create a more godly perspective. So that when crises come, you won't lose hope. James, the brother of Jesus, said the same thing just like this. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go into such and such a town and we'll spend a year there and trade and make a profit. (laughs) Yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life, James says? You're a mist that appears for a little time and then 
vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your, if you have a Bible out, you might want to circle this word, arrogance. All such boasting is evil. What these two men of God knew, what I'm trying to relate to you wherever you are, is that it is the height of arrogance for people like me and people like you and all the Western world to think, I know what tomorrow holds. No, you don't. No, you don't. None of us does. And all the little things we try to do to put into place to make ourselves feel like there's some sense of security for tomorrow are there as illusions. The only security we actually have is in what God tells us is actually on the horizon for tomorrow. And so I think you've probably been able to capture the big idea of this whole message, which I've articulated like this. You are not in command of your destiny. So, set your house in order. This is not just the command that we see in these two passages, one from Solomon and one from James, but it's also the only reasonable response to what God so clearly wants us to understand in every crisis. The lesson is that you're not in command. He is. The one who has written yesterday, today, and tomorrow in advance. The Alpha and the Omega. And what is your only suitable response? I had better prepare. I had better get my house in order. Let me talk to you for just a brief moment about preparedness. Preparedness is not a suggestion from God. It is a command. That all true followers of Jesus Christ must, must obey. Those who fail to prepare for what God guarantees you is on the horizon for this planet and for his church. Those who fail to prepare, Jesus says, will be caught off guard. And when they're caught off guard, they will be put to shame because they didn't take his countless warnings seriously. In light of this current crisis, the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis, God is giving you and me and the whole wide world a chance to take him seriously. If we would listen to that short quote that I gave you from that Naval University professor. If we would just begin to take God seriously. We could change the whole world. And so this morning. I want to give you three principles of preparedness. That God's people from the beginning of time. Down through the end of time must employ if they're going to begin to take God seriously again. Look, wherever you are, I'm speaking directly to you. God is speaking directly to you through your TV screen, as strange as that may feel right now. The question I have for you, the question God has for you is, are you ready to take him seriously? Or are you just going to treat God as though he's some fringe on the tapestry of your otherwise busy life. Now is the time, America. Now is the time, Christian, to take God seriously again. He is giving us a lesson if we would only have ears to hear. Will you hear? Let's look at the first principle of preparedness that God wants his people to know. Principle number one, be prepared to adapt. Here's what we're going to learn. God brings about a crisis, just so happens to be this particular one. 
God brings about a crisis to remind his people to be flexible, to be yielded, not stubborn, and to be broken-willed. That's a characteristic of all Christian people. Look at me, look, look with me at Philippians chapter 4. Here's what I want to show you. I don't expect you to take my word for any of these things. I want to give you the testimony of a man who was under such constant hardship and persecution. One crisis after another, this poor man endured. And you know what it did? It taught him a lesson. And you know what the lesson was? To adapt. To be flexible. To be content in whatever situation God brought into his life. Don't take my word for this. Listen to his testimony for yourself. Philippians 4 has it. Paul says, I have learned. He's been in a classroom. I've learned. In whatever situation I am, to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Here's a man who has learned to adapt. So when a crisis comes, he doesn't get shaken. He knows what it is to have abundance. He knows what it is to have a stocked fridge. And he knows what it is to have nothing and stand in a bread line. When God prospers this kind of a man, he accepts it with humility. He doesn't go, I did this. No, not this kind of a man. Not the kind of man who writes this. When God prospers that kind of a man, he accepts it as a gift from God's gracious abundance. Not out of something that he's done. And when things are hard, he accepts it as a classroom. Lord, what might you have to teach me? A man like this says. There's a secret to this sort of mindset. Did you pick it up there? Paul wants all believers everywhere to embrace this secret to contentment. It's there in the latter half of verse 12 and then verse 13. Take a look at your screen and you'll see it. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and of hunger. Of abundance and need. And here's the secret. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The simple principle that Paul wants all believers everywhere to endorse and embrace and to pass along to others. It doesn't matter right now if you're facing hunger or you have an abundance. This is for you. The secret to make sure that you remain grounded in reality and prepared for whatever is next for tomorrow because you don't know what's coming tomorrow. The secret is this. He's saying that because I am in Christ and Christ has promised me eternal life, that frees me to deal with whatever God has for me next. So he doesn't get too caught up in what's happening in this particular moment because he knows in the blinking of an eye, it could change. It could change. You know what that does? It enables a person to hold on to this life very loosely. It enables a person to let go of all the things they're trying to hold on to and preserve and keep safe. It allows a person to let go of this life and hold on tightly to the promise of eternal life and to the one who is promised right now that he is preparing a place for you. A better place for you. That is the secret to contentment. It allows a person to let go. 
in the coming weeks and months, I believe God is telling His people that we need to be prepared for change. Change seems to be on the very near horizon, not only for our country, but for the new global community that has been forming steadily over the years, and especially for the church. We need to be prepared for a new normal when this situation begins to settle, this current crisis that is. I'm no prophet, but I believe what Jesus said would eventually come to pass here on the earth. And as that picture of the Bible's final stage begins to emerge, the church needs to begin to adapt, just like we read it as Paul commended to all believers through all time. We need to be prepared to think like soldiers out on the battlefield, ready to give up our very lives for the cause of Christ. While we're not in command of our destiny, I hope I've been showing that to you, we are commanded to live with the ability to adapt in a moment's notice to change. Like a soldier who's in a foreign nation, who's not in our homeland yet. We sojourners, that's what the Bible calls you if you're a Christian. We need to live ready, willing, and able to change course as soon as our commander-in-chief gives the order. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, Proverbs 19 says. But it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. We need to be prepared to change our plans in a moment's notice. Because God's purpose and plan for this planet will stand. The second principle of preparedness is utterly critical. And as I was preparing this week, I'll be honest with you, a little bit of fear set in that very few would even give this second principle of preparedness a second thought. Look at it with me now. Principle number two, be prepared to testify. Here's what we're going to learn. God brings about a crisis, not just this particular one, but all crises, to remind his people to be prepared to speak the truth in love, no matter what it costs. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Peter says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, of course, do it with gentleness and respect. Church, being prepared to make a defense, of course, means always being able to explain why you believe what you believe to anyone who asks you, Why do you put your trust in Jesus Christ? Of course it means that. But it's beyond that. Being prepared to make a defense means having the determination to speak up when things begin to heat up, which is happening right now. When is it, do you suppose... That the world needs to hear the truth most. Come on, you can figure this out. Isn't it obvious? The world needs to hear bold truth the most when the world becomes most bold and, dare I say, flamboyant in their sin. The world is crying out right now. For bold Christians who are willing to lay down on the altar of sacrifice for the truth. Now's the time. 
Now is the time for all Christians to put away lukewarmness and to step out on the playing field. And declare the truth of the gospel with ferocity, of course in love, and of course with gentleness and respect. But now's the time. To say nothing. As the world prepared for the great flood would have made Noah an unrighteous man. Some might even say that to say nothing on Noah's part, as God told him what was about to come on the earth, would have made Noah an accomplice to the destruction of mankind. If Noah knew what it was that happens to people who die without Christ, and yet he decided... I don't feel like saying anything. What if people don't like me? What if people hate me? What would we say about Noah as we read the story back in Genesis 6, 7, and 8? We would say, shame on you, Noah. Don't you know the world is about to be condemned to a worldwide flood? And I'm saying to all of you, the second flood that God promises to come on the earth is a flood of fire, according to Peter. And it will make the first flood look like nothing by way of comparison. That's not my opinion. Jesus said that the time that is coming, still future, onto the earth, will be a time unlike any other time in human history, nor any time that ever will be. That includes the time of Noah. And so Noah had 120 years from the time when God called him to build the ark and the time when the floodwaters came. That's about two lifetimes for the average person. What that tells us is that we're supposed to spend our entire lives warning people of the impending final stage of human history and to be prepared for when it does come. I've been delighted to see so many believers taking to social media since this pandemic began. I've been delighted to see it. People who typically don't come on to platforms like social media, they come on and they've been sharing Bible verses and it's brought a smile to my face as I've seen it. In a time where we have limited exposure to one another, wherever you are, if you're about to get up and go to the kitchen, get a cup of coffee, I'm going to ask you to stop what you're doing and give me your undivided attention. Maybe even turn the volume up. In a time when we have limited interaction with one another, this social distancing thing, the world is meeting on the platform of social media for this particular moment in world history. That's where dialogue is happening. And so this is where humanity is taking place. It's happening virtually right now. And so if you are not going to engage that particular platform, even if you're not comfortable doing it, then what you're deciding to do is to sit on the sidelines and give it away to the enemy. We have to decide as a church whether or not we're going to surrender the main meeting space where people are meeting right now in this particular time Over to the enemy of their souls. Or are we going to flood Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and all of the virtual meeting places with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Every one of us needs to decide. You need to decide. Now is the time to get in the game. The time is coming according to the Bible. When your testimony of allegiance to Jesus is going to come at a high cost. Namely, it's going to cost some their lives. And so I'm calling you in this service to be prepared. Be prepared for change. Be prepared for persecution. 
be prepared for whatever it is that God has next. Be prepared to share your testimony, even if it costs you your life. Before we move on to our third and final principle of preparedness, I want to commend something to you. I think every Christian on planet Earth needs to ask themselves a question about what it is that we desire when we say, I can't wait for things to get back to normal. If we're asking God to get us back to normal, what are we really asking for? Are we asking for what's best? And if we are, best for who? Is going back to the way things were before best for the advancement of the gospel? Or is getting back to normal a more comfortable way to do life? Will, will it allow you to go through your life with the routine complacency that most Americans have grown accustomed to? Is that the normal that we're asking God to bring us back to? If so, I just want to put this out there for all of your consideration. Is that what we think is best for the gospel to advance? Let me tell you why I think it's not. Because the gospel shines brightest, not on sunny days, but on dark days. History has proven that the gospel advances more frequently when the church is under persecution. I'm not suggesting that we ask that God bring persecution. What I am suggesting is that God would change what we have called normal in the United States for so long. I can tell you, I don't want to go back to the way things were. I'm not comfortable going back to lukewarm complacency any longer, and I hope you're not either. When we go back to the way things should be, where we're able to meet together in person, I want to be part of a church that's on fire for the gospel with people who are willing to trade their very lives to get it to the ends of the earth. Don't you? Point number three, our final principle. Be prepared to meet God at any moment. Church, please don't tune me out just yet. This is the most important thing I have to say to you in this message. Here's what you're going to learn. God brings about a crisis, just like the one we're in, to give his people a reality check and to ignite revival in their hearts. We're going to look at a passage in Amos chapter 4. But before we do, I need to give you a bit of context and a bit of background. What you're about to read is strong language. It is. Here's what you need to know about the original people that this was written to. See if you can pinpoint some similarities. The people that Amos, a prophet, was called by God to preach to were a very comfortable people. He was called to the northern tribe of Judah in Israel. And Amos was called to a people who were living pretty comfortably. There was no war, which was a pretty rare thing for the people at that time. They were living comfortable under King Jeroboam II. They had an abundance of uh, resources to do life with. And because of that, here's the key. They stopped taking God seriously. Oh, sure, they still went to worship services and Gave God his due. But they stopped making God the central point of their lives. Listen to what God said to a people like that. Amos chapter 4. This is God speaking through Amos. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. That simply means a famine, or a shortage of food. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. 
Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. I would send rain on one city and send no rain on another city. One field would have rain and the field on which I did not rain, it did not rain, would wither. So two or three cities would wander to another city to drink water and would not be satisfied. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I struck you with blight, which means diseases on plant life, and mildew. Your many gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees and your olive trees, the locust devoured. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword. That means they went to war. And carried away your horses. And I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you. As when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were as a brand plucked out of the burning. Yet, you didn't return to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel. Because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. I don't think I need to spell out for you the implications for any nation or any people group that fails to take seriously God's harbingers of repentance. Harbingers. Warnings signposts that God gives so that a people will repent and turn back to him in revival. Let me remind you of a few of those that God has given to us. He gave us 9-11, a clear harbinger, a sign to return to him. God has shown us unfathomable mercy and grace and patience as the people of God, by and large, have stood idly by as the greatest genocide in human history has taken place on our watch. I am speaking, of course, of what we call a woman's right to choose murder. God has given us Harbinger after harbinger, crying out to his people to return to him. Let me remind you of a few of those harbingers. Stock market collapse in 2008. Regular upticks in natural disasters like California wildfires, the degree of which our country has never seen anything like it. Tornado cluster outbreaks that ravage the Midwest. The list of major hurricanes that have torn our nation upside down and ripped our economy apart is astounding. I challenge you to go online and look them up for yourselves. Here are a few names that might ring a bell. Hurricane Sandy, Maria, Irma, Harvey, and Katrina. Katrina, the costliest natural disaster in U.S. history. The list goes on repeatedly with things like this. These are God's harbingers. God screaming out to his people just as he has always done to return to him. Are we listening? Are we listening? Are you listening? In the stubbornness of our nation... And in the lethargy of a sleeping and complacent church, we have not returned to him. In case you might be someone who's sitting at home thinking, this is just alarmist nonsense. 
All things are going to continue. This crisis will blow over and things will return to normal. Let me tell you, this crisis will end and things will return to what many would call normal. But I can assure you, they will not be normal. God is moving the time clock along. And there is an appointed day on his calendar when his son will return. And I can assure you that on that day, there will only be two kinds of people in the world. People who were ready and people who were not. The call of God down throughout history is to take the warnings of his son seriously. Here is one of those warnings directly from the mouth of the son of God. You determine whether or not you're going to listen. Here's what Jesus said. So you too must keep watch. For you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time. For the Son of Man will come along when least expected. Are you ready? As we steer this in for a landing, I want to tell you of a man, a leader, a world leader, who was called by God to get his house in order. Let me show you that passage. It's found in 2 Kings 20, verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became sick. And was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die. You shall not recover. Setting your house in order does not mean becoming a prepper, as we would call it. It doesn't mean stockpiling your your fridge. It doesn't mean stockpiling food and Ammo, that's not what setting your house in order means. It means setting your inner house in order. Being prepared at any moment to meet your God. What God said to this king long ago, he's saying to every single person within the sound of my voice, every one of us needs to get our inner life in order and be prepared to meet our God at a moment's notice because as we've been saying all along, you don't know what tomorrow holds. Do you? The time has come for every person not only to take God seriously, but to get your house in order. To be prepared to stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords In a moment's notice, I want to give you practical step-by-step counsel as to how every single person should get their life in order. This is not something that God wants to leave up to you or up for grabs. He has given us clear-cut instructions for how to go about getting your house in order. Are you interested? I hope right now in your home or in your den or wherever you're listening, you're going, yes, I'm interested. I want to start taking God seriously again or for the first time in my life. If that's you, if that's you, here are a few simple, biblical, faithful steps that God gives to all mankind to get your life ready to meet your maker. Number one, it begins with surrender. Your house will never, ever be in order, ready to meet God, until you wave the white flag. Every single person was born wanting to do life by their own authority. Everyone. I was. You are. Until you surrender and say, God, I've tried it my way. I surrender all to you. Your house is not in order, and you are not ready to meet God. Wherever you are, surrender to him. Surrender is the first step to getting your house in order. Second step, you have to believe. What? Lots of people say they believe lots of things. Here's specifically what the New Testament declares that you need to believe. You need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That he died for your sins personally. That you owe a debt to God that you cannot pay. And that he paid the debt in your place. 
that he was your scapegoat. He took the sin that you earned and in place he is giving his perfect life of righteousness to you. So that when you stand before God, you can be declared not guilty. You must believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation. And that God gives it to you by grace alone, through faith alone. That you cannot earn your salvation. You must declare that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except through Him. If you believe that, God will count your sins as clean. Wipe the slate clean and count the perfect righteousness of his son on your bank account. It's the greatest news in the world. It's called the gospel. And you must believe it. The third step, you need to repent. Once you believe, you must actively forfeit your old way of doing life. And you must return to Jesus Christ as your new way of life. Repent means to change directions. Begins with a change of mind that came from a changed heart. And then it produces a changed lifestyle and changed behaviors. If your beliefs are legitimate and God has really changed your heart, it will produce a lifestyle of repentance. Changed behaviors. Where suddenly you will begin to obey him out of new desires. That's the last step. Obey. The final thing everyone does whose house is in order is they begin to obey God and obey his word. Not out of compulsion. No true Christian that I know obeys out of compulsion. They obey because the desires of their heart have been changed. And they now long to obey God. They want what he wants. It doesn't come overnight. It's a long, lifelong change where I want to obey you, Lord. I know there's this other part of me that wants to go back to my old ways. But now there's this new way in me that desires obedience. Christian. This is what it looks like to get your house in order. If those desires are in you, you can rest assured that if you died today, your salvation would be secure. And no matter what crisis is on the horizon for tomorrow, if it's an economic crisis, if it's a personal crisis for you, you can know for sure that you will be saved. What other more important thing is there than that? Church, look back again at Proverbs 27, 1, where we started. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Church, I want to pray about this with you now. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, oh, Father, may this message spread like wildfire across the globe. In these Days of confusion, I pray, that your sovereign solution would be made known to those who will have ears to hear it. Let it be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the star, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. And sings my soul, my Savior God. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art.
son not sparing Send him to God I scarce can take it in That on the cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my sin Then sings my soul My Savior God how great thou art, how great thou art, who sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, when Christ shall come, we shout of acclamation. Take me home, what joy shall fill my heart, and I will bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, my God, how great Thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art. my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, Savior God to thee. How great thou art, 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 how great.